Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm Nicholas Brash, Director of Melbourne Jewish Book Week, and I'd like to start this evening by acknowledging that we uh, meet tonight in a virtual way, but on the lands of the um, First Nations peoples, and I pay my respects to elders past, uh, present and emerging, and any who are with us tonight. Um, welcome to the second Tuesday of the month, which will be known forthwith as uh, Melbourne Jewish Book Week evening. Um, we will, on the first, um, on the second Tuesday of every month, we will endeavour to bring you all manner of um, liter literary events. Um, and stay tuned at the end of this evening's offering, because I want to tell you about our first book event, which is next month. Uh, but tonight, we have the pleasure of the company of two, well, Melbourne-bred film identities, um, director Ben Lewin and, and critic Jan Epstein. I hope you've all seen Ben's uh, latest film, The Catcher is a Spy, because they will be talking about it, uh, as well as about highlights from uh, uh, other areas of Ben's career. But if you haven't seen it, um, no problem. I'm sure after tonight you'll be, you'll be logging on to, uh, to Netflix or iTunes and watching it straight away. Um, if you have a question for, for Ben, um, hold off for the moment, but maybe in about half an hour, type your question into the Q&A. Uh, section which you'll you'll find on on your device, whichever device you're using. Um, type it up, and um, at about twenty to nine or quarter to nine, Jan will start asking some of your questions. Um, unfortunately, we always get more questions than we can ask, so um, please uh, excuse us if your question isn't asked. Um, but we will we will do our best. Um, and on that night, I'd just like to hand over to to Jan and Ben, uh, and I will. Um, Come back at the end of this evening. Jan, over to you. Thank you very much, Nick. Very much indeed. Now, welcome everyone to this interview with Ben, whose early films and TV series were very, very important. In fact, they were key to the revival of Australian film in the 1980s. And um, I'm thinking particularly of two films, Ben's um, television series, The De Niro Boys, which was uh, opened up the whole conversation about Jews in film in Australia and putting the Holocaust onto the screen. And then his quirky little film, The Favour, the, the Watch and the Very Big Fish, which I absolutely adored. But we're here tonight to discuss principally his latest film, which is The Catcher as a Spy. And we'll discuss this later and we'll go into it uh, in some detail. And of course, your, your, your questions will be largely about that. But I'd like to begin the conversation first, um, including the title of the interview, which is from page to screen. Now, this seems to me to be a tricky question, but I'm interpreting it as meaning what's different about writing a story to turning it into pictures on the screen. And there's really no one better than Ben to talk about this because He's a great scriptwriter, and I'm sure he's got other works, written works, to his um, in his library and to his credit. Um, so, Ben, if you're there, I can't see you at the moment, but I'm assuming that you can hear everything that I'm saying. The first question is, how do you go about adapting written material to the screen? Can you fill us in on that? Well... I, um, let's narrow that a little bit because um, uh, are we talking about a published book as mm -hmm. opposed to just a screenplay? Because okay. uh, um, uh, so did, just let, let me know which, which, which direction I should be Exactly. Down. It's a big direction and I, I want to eventually get a small um, discussion with you about adapting great works, well-known novels to the screen. But particularly with this, the film, The Catcher Was a Spy, and I keep calling it The Catcher in the Rye, so if I make that mistake, right. please That's forgive right. me. I'm sure a lot of people do. I know that comes from the, um, the biography of Mo Bird, but I'm not sure of how you got onto the film, whether you were asked to do the film and therefore the script came later, or whether you were in actively involved in some way with, with um, writing the script for it. And more importantly, um, how much leeway do you give yourself to tamper 
with other people's creativity, if you are using other people's screenplays as well as other people's novels for your own purposes? You know, uh, it's, it's a very broad question. Um, uh, in this particular case, in the case of Catcher Was a Spy, it, it had its own very particular circumstances. Quite interesting. Um, Tell us, we'd love it. Well, I, I mean, how did it how did it come to me? Usually, these things happen by pure accident. As far mm -hmm. as I know, an actor friend um, was talking me up at a party with a couple of young producers who were looking to attach a director to their project. The catcher was a spy. Mm -hmm. Before I know mm -hmm. it, there's a phone call, and then there's a meeting. We all like each other. And I read this fascinating um, story about a character I'd never heard of, which, you know, to start with, that's, oh, wow, that's exciting. I've never heard of this. Exactly, <laughs> exactly the same feeling I got when I first heard the story of the De Niro boys. You know, I'm walking along with Henry Talbot and um, saying, Henry, how did, how did you come to Australia? I said, oh, in the most traditional possible style as a convict. Uh-huh, so tell me more. So mm. in a similar way, the, the, just the idea of this Jewish baseball player who became a spy and was sent to assassinate Heisenberg, it sounded like such an unlikely and preposterous story, and yet it was true. So uh, it, 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 the conversation continued. Um, the, the challenge at that point um, is not and in interpretation mm. of the script. The challenge is then to get the movie made. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you need to do is to attach a star. Mm. Um, and um, I had a certain amount of currency. I mean, Hollywood is very, um, sort of almost like accountancy because I'd, um, you know, made a movie with, uh, um, Helen Hunt. Helen Hunt. Yeah, fantastic. And she got an she got an Oscar nomination. <laughs> so I'm I'm the go-to guy to get certain sorts of actors Oscar nominations. I mean, it's almost like I've become an algorithm. And so, do you feel this is a fantasy somewhere that you're actually dreaming all of this because it seems absolutely ma amazing to me that you've done so well in America that people are begging you to make films with such oh. incredible actors like Helen Hunt and Jeff Daniels. Anyway, off you well, go, Ben, I'm interrupting. I, I guess that, um, you know, if, uh, I, I have had uh, over the years, you know, developed a good way with actors, a good relationship with them mm. so that there's a level of trust, which is essentially all it's about. Mm. Um, that they think you're going to try and get the best out of them. And um, I, I'm fairly good at casting, just, you know, fitting the face to the, mm. to the words on the page um, and, and often thinking, you know, sideways. Anyway, that's the way it goes. These young producers, I think, um, at one level, looked at me as... Uh, uh, an asset and say, well, he's a guy who can attract cast. Mm. And one way or another, it gets round to Paul Rudd, who uh, I know through um, Michael Douglas, who, uh, you know, we'd been involved with in mm. a project and... A little Jewish clique, perhaps, Ben. Well, uh, <laughs> you know... It's funny, all you need over there is, is one breakthrough movie and um, you've got a, a free pass for a certain amount of time to mm. connect with, you know, people who are impressed by that. <laughs> so um, I was able to attract Paul Rudd um, and then the whole question of how the script was going to evolve mm. became an issue. Now, I, I don't, you know, I then 
read Nicholas Davidoff's book because now we were talking, we'd attacked mm. a major star, we're really making a movie. Or mm. uh, that's how you need to think at that point in time. Um, because the star will attract the money and so it <clears throat> goes. So um, uh, I'd read, I read Nicholas Davidoff's book and I kind of, you know, I took a step backwards. I was, I was really amazed because um, in the script, um, the main engine behind the character was his um, secret homosexuality. Mm. It was very kind of prominent throughout. And the writer, um, you know, who'd, who'd written um, Saving Private Ryan. Uh, yes, that's um, Robert Rodat, was that right? Yes. yes. He had the reputation of writing muscular scripts. Mm -hmm. you know, action-oriented <laughs> stuff. Yeah. And, nice. it, and, and all right, the truth about Nicholas Davidoff's book, and it's just my opinion, was that even after having read it twice, I really still didn't have an idea of who Mo Berg was. Mm. He was still an enigma. There was an account of, you know, how he was born. This happened, this happened, this happened. A lot of fascinating detail. But it didn't get to for me to create a picture of the man that, uh, you know, I could say, well, this is, I could summarize it and tell someone, well, this, this was a guy who was um, a committed alcoholic, but just the same, he managed to rescue 20 people from a, da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't say, you know, the, the, um, one of the, one of the, most interesting aspects of the Moberg story was how shabby the later years of his life were. Um, and um, what a sad sort of deep mm. crescendo it was from a man who'd really done remarkable things during the war. Mm. Uh, now, none of that was in the movie. You know, this story had so been... So you selected. You, you selected what you felt was more relevant to the tale, which was more I, re I didn't reasonable as far this as... Was a, this was a project... This was a project in which I didn't get to do the selecting, uh, you know, in the sense mm. that I was a gun for hire. I didn't own the project. I hadn't... Mm. I hadn't written the script. I was there as the director. And the the there are limits to what I could do with the story as it was told. Mm. Um, it, it had been around since sometime in the 90s uh, after Nicholas Davidoff had written the book. It originally had been with Steven Soderbergh and George Clooney, who wow. at that time were the biggest mm. names. Mm. They couldn't get it made. I never read the script, but I understand that it was a very cerebral script. It mm. was, it just didn't grab you as a sort of a spy movie. Was that, you're, you're talking about Rodat's script? No, I'm talking about the script mm. that preceded his. Okay. You know, since we're, we're talking about how does a book get to become yeah. a movie. <laughs> That's right, but what did, did um, Davidoff have anything to do with the script writing or was he out of it at that stage? The original writer, somehow he seems to have been swept aside and someone, another script comes in. Was he asked, was he involved in any way? I don't think he was involved very much, no. No. I mean, I don't know because Robert Rodat wrote this book. <clears throat> okay. uh, I, I did ultimately meet Nicholas Davidoff and mm. The, the book, the, the film and the book are miles apart, light years apart. Uh, There's no copyright between that or he must have acceded his um, rights over the telling of the story the way he wrote it originally. He didn't write it like a film script. No, no, but I mean, still he owned the, 
for people who read right. um, for, for people yeah, yes but he sold those <clears throat> rights to you know people who wanted to make he a sold book. it because it's called that isn't it it's called the catcher was a spy that was his yes. title yes, yes. okay and, That's and interesting. there are there are a lot of elements of the of the book <clears throat> Um, which are in the film, um, but um, I don't think the film was faithful to the book. I mean, I suspect that the original script, the very cerebral sort of script, may have been more faithful to the book, but they couldn't get that made. Uh, Rodat wrote an action-oriented script. Hmm. He turned Mo, Mo Berg into an all-American hero. Hmm. Um, he turned him into a somewhat James <clears throat> Bond type of character. Um, uh, the real Moberg had no idea how to handle a gun. You know, he would drop it and bits would fall off it. And, you know, <laughs> he was a total klutz with a gun. Mm. Um, he was an intellectual. Yes. Um, and and he, was, he was Jewish too. Yeah. And however, in the way that Rodat chose to turn this story into an action hero story, it also gave the script, the whole project, the energy it needed to get made. No one wants to make an expensive war movie, uh, which is an exploration of a confused mind. Hmm. Um, and this was an expensive, well, not so expensive, but it was a war movie, it was an action movie, which was about someone who was depicted as an action hero. And that is a, was a big departure from the book, but also a step in the direction of actually getting the movie made. Um, sorry, did you want to ask me something at this point? Just the, the, I'm wondering about the realism of the actual character. We're talking about fiction here and interpretations. And I'm wondering about the real Moberg. There's something about the Rodet script that I really liked. And that was Heisenberg's all about the uncertainty principle. And I love the mystery about the, um, the Mo character because one minute you think he's gay and the next minute he's got Estelle and he's loving her. So there's an uncertainty there. And I thought that spilled out the whole notion of the uncertainty, the mystery, the enigma, so essential to the Heisenberg and the story about the making of the bomb, that to me, that's one of the uh, standout pieces of the film. Is it has a, cer a certain reality about that, but we're getting back to from page to screen, but the story seems to be, to be almost fictional. It doesn't seem as far as you can say, that it has much um, basis in the original Moberg character. Is there anyone alive that would know, remember still, the Moberg character? Yes, I spoke to a, a lady mm -hmm. who we dated. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. The gay fellow who dates. That's so beautiful. It's sort of... And... and you, you know, because quite honestly, I was very troubled by the uh, emphasis on his bisexuality. Um, and um, it was one of the things that attracted Paul Rudd to the movie, that this mm. was a man, you know, who had this terrible inner conflict about his terrible secret. Mm. And, uh, but there was not a lot of historical fact about this. Mm. And one of the things mm. I found uh, reassuring was talking to this lady who he had dated. And she, re she thought he was bisexual. Um, and also we managed to, you know, my son got a whole bunch of letters from Princeton Library that were written to him by uh, Estella, his mm. girlfriend. <laughs> Um, and they were very illuminating about his character. Mm. Um, but uh, um, uh, it, it was um, it, really his character had to be invented from the ground up. The book yeah. didn't provide Paul or me with the, the emotional content of his character. Mm. 
um, which, which is, you know, the core to uh, interpreting something in a film. And yes. a novel gives you that, you know, mm. a novel tells you what drives a man, what his real secrets are, you know, you see inside. But mm. Moberg was truly an imp impenetrable character. Why on earth didn't he kill Heisenberg? This to me was the great mystery. I'd like to think that if I were there, I would have killed him. Well, that's, a, that's a, another uncertainty in the whole yes, business. Yes, yes. Which it is, will never be known. Latched on, essentially. Yeah. It'll never be known, really, to what degree Heisenberg felt that he could produce the bomb or he even knew how to do it properly because he didn't have the resources. Because with the Americans producing the bomb, the Manhattan process, uh, Project, it took, you know, millions of dollars and it was an extraordinarily expensive thing to do and they weren't doing it through heavy water and the, the way that Germans were doing it was getting the heavy water from Norway. So perhaps Heisenberg um, knew that they could never really produce the bomb and he had again an uncertainty feel about he, he felt he was German but he wasn't a Nazi. He wanted to have his um, professionalism and his uh, scientific the, the glamour of the Nobel Prize winner. He wanted his own country to recognise that. But perhaps he always knew underneath that the Nazis were too chaotic in the management of the, what they call the circle of evil of Hitler's people, that they didn't have the capacity, let alone the resources. They were too busy opening up on the Eastern Front and too busy trying to kill the Jews to properly make the bomb. So perhaps Mo Berg was aware of this and perhaps something was communicated with Heisenberg himself. But a lot of people don't know, the feeling in physicist circles are that he probably um, didn't think he could produce it and therefore didn't worry about it so much and was happy just to go along. Well, um, I, 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 I love history and uh, getting into this stuff. And I think I got into it a bit too deeply um, mm. because uh, the, the, the debate on Heisenberg's motives um, still goes on. Uh, mm. I, I mean, um, they do. Uh, and, okay. and I, I couldn't, you know, you know, I tended to fall on the, the side of um, Gutschmidt, who's one of the characters in the movie, who, mm. you know, if you read what, what he wrote, he, he believed Heisenberg knew what he was doing. Mm. You know, that, that, that what, um, that he intended to create a, a bomb and that what um, stopped okay. him was his own arrogance, um, that uh, there were areas in which he was a little bit out of his depth. And uh, anyway, um, uh, I, one of the little factoids that I found very interesting was that Oppenheimer, who was leading the um, Manhattan Project, mm -hmm. in a conversation with General Groves, who was his boss, so to speak, you know, discussing mm -hmm. what they should do about Heisenberg, Oppenheimer's opinion was just kill him. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, don't start to split. Well, maybe he can and maybe he can't. He's the head of the damn atomic bomb project for the Germans. You mm. just kill him. Um, and um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I in a way, found... Um, I, I wondered what had gone through Moberg's head. Mm. You, you know, he was not... He was not an assassin. Um, mm. by trade. Um, the idea of killing mm. anyone, let alone someone of the stature of Isaac Newton or Einstein, <laughs> you know, probably appalled yes. him. Um, yes. And I, I can imagine that he was looking for every reason not to. Um, but even, then why was he not using what the Americans use, which was um, the, uh, the moderator? That, that they, the American Manhattan Project didn't go down the heavy water track. It went down the graphite track. I mean, I only know this because I'm 
vaguely interested in it. I don't understand the workings of it. But it does seem to me that the Americans and the Germans were using different techniques and that Heisenberg being the clever man he was, I can't believe that he didn't know that there was another way of doing it, whether he could convey this to the Nazis or not. But anyway, um, can I ask you something? Can we move on into another area? Because this could be discussed all day and it would be fascinating, but we want to allow people to ask questions to you about the film. Sure, sure. So I'm interested, um, to your Jewish character, quite often in the film, we're told that he's Jewish. Um, and some of your films have Jewish content. Certainly your earlier films have Jewish content enormously. Um, and yet other films that you take seem to be quite different and you go out onto a different limb. Are these all aspects of your personality then, what you choose to use as your storyline, what you use to make films with? Um, There's also a disability element in, in for example, the, um, the Helen Hunt, mm. the, um, I've forgotten, what's her name? What's the... The, the, the sessions, the sessions. Yeah. I love that. I saw it when it came out in 2002. Oh, yeah, so thanks. do your films come out of you or you, I, can you be objective sometimes? Well, um, I like to think that um, I, I, I can be objective. I, I mean, if, um, if I was to teach writing, um, I would probably encourage people to um, to do the opposite of what is generally taught in these. Oh, write about yourself, write about things you know about. And I would encourage the opposite, mm -hmm. look outside yourself mm -hmm. and write about what you see, uh, what, what interests you in other people. So I like to think, you know, I'm objective in that sense. Um, uh, but of course, I mean, everything I do is kind of infected by my approach to things, which is sometimes a bit too impulsive. I mean, you should see the scenes that end up on mm. the cutting room floor. Mm. <laughs> That's right. Yes. So, uh, so, um, um, I, I, I think that you probably maybe think that there's a, um, an agenda going on, which isn't going on. I, I, I mean, I've just, I've never had a sort of a plan of what I'm mm. going to, no. what, what direction I'm going to take. I mean, yeah. stuff just happens. Uh, um, and um, I, I sometimes look for the kind of the pivotal points where you think, wow, if this hadn't happened, then I wouldn't be where I am today, whether, you know, mm. better or worse. Um, but um, I've always been drawn to, if you like, tragic comedy. Mm. Um, I mean, Helen Hunt called me up a couple of weeks into shooting the sessions and mm. said, is this a comedy? I said, oh, I'm glad <laughs> you've got me. <laughs> Finally figured it out. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I guess that I... Um, I, you know, I look for the absurdity in, in real situations and, um, um, I, I, you know, I, I guess that's, that's as much of a common thread. I mean, these common threads, if you like, are best observed by other people. I mean, I'm probably less aware of what they are than you are. <laughs> I'd love to go back to the Dinera boys. Because mm. to me, that was an absolutely key film, 1985. And it was the first film in 50 years that had Jewish characters. And you managed to get that on Channel 7, I remember. It came in Channel 10. 10. Mm -hmm. Was it 10? Was it? Okay. Um, and it was a mini-series. You can, you can see it as a film. It was extraordinarily powerful. Where did that come from? Um, it was so extraordinary to, to produce a film that was comic and tragic. It was about the Holocaust, but it was about the De Niro boys. 
and I know that you worked in tandem with the, Bob Weiss was the producer there. How did that, how did that begin? And the flowering of it was so extraordinary. Um, you know, it, 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 it began, I, I think that what it took was <coughs> a tenacity, which I had then as a young man. Mm. <laughs> I don't know how much of that I, I've got because it took a good 10 years to make. And I stuck with it during that time. Um, it began, as I mentioned before, with a conversation with a... <coughs> Uh, he was probably Australia's most successful fashion photographer, Henry Talbot. Um, mm -hmm. Started a business um, um, uh, anyway. He was a De Niro boy, and he told me his story. Mm. And um, uh, <clears throat> you know, the next thing that happened was that I was in London at a time when the thirty-year rule had expired on certain public records, including those which covered the De Niro episode. Okay. And there was a good friend of mine in London at the same time doing some research for, a, you know, some history PhD he was doing. I'm sure a very well-known character in Melbourne, Rob Mann. Mm. You must know Rob Mann, Robert. Yes, Mann. yes. Anyway, <laughs> Rob was doing, and I said, Not as personally as you do, obviously. Well, you know, it's it's been a while since we connected, but at that That's time right. we used to hang out a lot, and um, and he found <laughs> stacks of documents from the Home Office and the Foreign Office, which completely, you know, wow, these were all the official things signed by Winston Churchill, signed mm. by, and and it really. Um, gave the whole thing tremendous substance. The whole story began to unfold. And then I thought, well, um, I'll, uh, I'll start interviewing people who were on there. And I spent the best part of two years running around different parts of the world interviewing survivors. I don't know how many mm. I interviewed, but it was a lot. Mm. And then <clears throat> started writing a script with a um with a partner and um that god that took another year and um the script was no good it was just a distillation of two years of research which didn't read like a dramatic script so mm. and i parted company and then i started all over again and then I don't know how many years in total elapsed, but finally I had a script which was able to attract actors. And, um, uh, and so... Um, it attracted it, Bob Hoskins. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. You couldn't have had a better choice. He was brilliant in that role. Yeah. It was as if it was written for him, especially. Yeah, and, and it, it then kind of snowballed i guess um mm -hmm. at first it was um uh, philip adams um, wanted to um, uh, produce it and we almost did but then the the guy who was um, backing it um found out it was about jews and decided <laughs> he wasn't going to spend his money on How it crazy but you didn't know uh, well no bit, because they were the kind of the um tax write-off days, you know, mm. 10 BA, you know, you know. Yes. When a lot of films were being made as financial transactions. Mm. Uh, and um, so it was very lucky that the script was ready at a time when you could get money for, for this sort of thing. And anyway, it fell over and then I connected with Bob Weiss, who I never had met, you know, I think we connected in London and decided that we want to do it together. Mm. And mm. he seemed to be really, really committed and yes. had a lot of energy and connections. And I don't know, <clears throat> that was it. in retrospect, I mean, how the hell did we ever get that paid? And it was quite a big budget for the time. Yeah, yeah would have been. 
Uh, and well, there was obviously trust in you because you obviously seemed to know what you were doing, but I'm um, not sure I did. it's a landmark <laughs> series. I, I think I learned on the job. I mean, yeah. I <clears throat> yes, you've been lucky. And, and then also the, the favour of the watch and the very big fish, that film with Jeff Goldberg, again, Jewish characters <clears throat> in such a bizarre situation. Jeff Goldberg, you're the photographer, he's posing as Jesus and then he begins to believe that he's the Messiah. What an extraordinary, wonderful story. I loved it. And then you went on to <clears throat> a matter of convenience. Well, a matter of convenience came first and uh -huh. the favour of the watch and the fish would... Oh, not... it did. Yes, it did. That's it, right. One would not have happened without the other. No, I remember though. I, mean, I remember watching the matter of convenience on television. Yeah, it was on television. Was it in two parts or was it just one? It was just one part. Yeah, just yeah. It was really very, very, very powerful. Yeah, and, and, and that led to the favour of the very big fish. Yeah, that's right. There was a French partner involved. Yes. Now, with your just a bit about your background, Ben. I know that you have a Polish background. You come here. <clears throat> And then you seem to be going over to America a lot. And then as far as I'm concerned, you disappeared in America, but you've produced this incredible body of work, which of course, um, the catcher is a spy, was a spy, is part of. And I hear now you're on another fascinating work with an absolutely mind boggling title to it called, can you Fall tell us? Falling for Figaro. Falling for Figaro, and I assume that Figaro is not Walt Disney's cat. <laughs> this is, it's got something to do with opera, perhaps. Yeah, Figaro is the barber of Seville. <laughs> right. Well, tell you, can you tell us about it? Sure. I mean, I mean it's a, a, a story about two young uh, opera singers in training, mm -hmm. in, in the same competition with the, the same teacher, um, uh, this, who's the singing teacher from hell, played by uh, Joanna Lumley. <coughs> um, yes, uh, wonderful. And how did you get her on, onto your cast list? Well, on a, a, you know, strangely enough, through again, it's through a network, through my good friend um, Elijah Mashinsky. Uh huh. Who, a local boy. A local boy. Who, <laughs> made good in England and yes, he did. has connections in the opera world and, uh, mm. and you know I was using anyway uh, 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 it was uh, uh, essentially through him um, and uh, Joanna's husband and Joanna she liked the script she was, <laughs> she was perfect for the role she was looking for something that was not <clears throat> fancy from Abfab uh, and where did the script come from? It originated um, with uh, um, an Australian writer called Alan Palmer. Um, uh, I did a, you know, my own version of the script, but it is <clears throat> based on his idea of an opera teacher set in a little Scottish town. <laughs> I love this part. And, um, and you know, uh, what I brought to it was the idea that um, she had this favourite, you know, the young baritone, who she came to realise would never really learn how to sing until he'd have his heart broken. <laughs> so, yes. along comes another student. <laughs> I see. So, um, Joanna's character kind of plays Cupid. I uh, see, I see. Eros. Always the breaks <laughs> breaks the boy's heart and he finds his mm. mother. Um, now you told me when we spoke about this, um, Ben, that this is the first Scottish Australian co-production mm. that you can think of, which makes it fascinating. How did that happen? The story originated in Scotland or <laughs> you're Australian? <coughs> the story actually originated <coughs> in Australia and uh -huh. I think at some point, certainly before it came to us, at some <clears> point <throat> someone figured it's going to be much more romantic if we set it 
in Scotland. <laughs> and, and I think that's that was, the case. I think that was correct. I mean, you, you know, I never, when, when, I, when, when I read the script, I never questioned that, wow, that's a great idea. Someone goes to <laughs> a little Scottish village and mm. learns opera from a crazy teacher and um, <laughs> it, it struck me as a beautiful setting. So we uh, ultimately got in, in, involved with a, Scot a Scottish production company. Uh, husband and wife producers who um, went and found us the money from Creative Scotland, who were wow, and and um, <clears throat> a lot of it is driven by uh, you know, private money in Australia from a man who just liked mm. the idea. Mm. Um, it's weird how these movies get together. Well, you're still in demand. I find it extraordinary. And your films, they get better and better and differenter and better. And the only other two filmmakers that I think have that capacity in my mind is Woody Allen and Clint Eastwood. I mean, they're both in their 80s. So you, you're in, you've got another decade or two, Ben, to keep going and produce films as long as people want you to do them. Yes. And, I, um, I'm only warming up. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Now, we're, we're getting close to the time when people would like to talk to you and ask mm -hmm. you questions about things. But I just want to throw off one question to you. It doesn't, a short answer. Mm -hmm. Do you think there are, are any, a lot of films come from books. We're talking about page to screen. A lot of the greatest films. I mean, uh, Milan Kundra's The Unbearable Lightness of Being. I couldn't imagine how they could make that into a film with the circular plot and then um, Philip Kaufman makes a, a linear script of it and you have the, the characters jumping to life, totally different to the original book, but a magnificent version of it. Are there any films that you think, any books rather, novels, that can't be made well into films? Or do you think that given the right people involved in it, literature, even the greatest literature, can be made that adaptation, there's something about the story and the story going to the screen that can enhance the, the, the book, not necessarily destroy people's pleasure in having read it. No, I, I can't think of any book that, um, whether it's a novel or a, a factual work, that can't be turned into a film. I, I think that the, uh, you know, the relationship between films and books is... Uh, <clears throat> A, a, a natural marriage, which mm. is another way of storytelling. And um, I, I think certainly now with the, with the internet and a whole lot of different ways of storytelling, I can't think of any book that you, you couldn't with some sort. I mean, um, the problems are really to do with conforming to things that you have to do in movies. I mean, if a movie is going to cost uh, over a certain amount of money, it has to have certain elements. So, um, uh, but if you're not constrained <clears throat> by that sort of thing, I, I don't see anything that any work <clears throat> that you can't interpret um, in a film. There's one film that I looked up, which I adored, and that's... Um, the White Hotel, D.M. Thomas's The White Hotel. And I found that three filmmakers had tried to bring that to the screen. And they are, uh, remarkably, Bernardo Bertolucci, David Lynch, and Emir Costa Rica. And they somehow couldn't bring it to the screen. And it's really one of my favorite novels. It's very, very memorable. It would be tricky to bring to the screen. So I'm, I'm interested, perhaps that's something that if I could only get someone to provide the money, we could perhaps get a, <laughs> an Australian American version uh, adaptation of the White Hotel and you would be the script writer and oh, you would be the director. But I don't think that I'm going to be able to get the money to do that. Now, we've got some Q&A questions here. And if I click on the screen there, they're coming up. Now, this is a question, it's a long one, Ben, from Charlotte Freeman, and she asks, well, 
with Melbourne having the highest per capita population of Shoah survivors outside of Israel, why do you think the first generation children born in Australia were so strongly confined to the professions, doctor, dentist, lawyer, accountant, etc., and discouraged from pursuing the arts, music and creativity, unlike their counterparts in the United States and other countries? And then she says, many of their parents would have learnt an instrument, etc. And P.S. My husband Russell and I have seen The Catcher as a Spy on our last cruise and absolutely loved it. We could not believe that we hadn't heard of it or seen publicity for it. So there you go, Ben. Two things to answer in that one. Well, um, I, I'm not sure that I can do anything other than speculation as to why more Jews involved in, in <coughs> uh, earlier in Australia. I think that um, historically, you know, Jews have been drawn to professions because they're uh, uh, portable uh, as opposed to things like farming, which, uh, then, you know, in many places they weren't historically allowed to own land. So I think there was yes. always, always a, a sort of a push to have um, the kids learn portable trades <coughs> Professions. Um, uh, I, I, I think that um, uh, a lot of um, filmmaking in, in Hollywood um, in the early years reflected Jewish experience um, in America. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm not sure that in, um, up, in uh, you know, up until a certain point I don't know when that was, there was all that much Jewish experience in Australia. It's not as if there was a city like New York, yes. which uh, you, you, know, you somehow identified as a, a hub of um, reborn Jewish life. Um, yes. And uh, I mean, that's the only thing I can think of, that, that Jews tend to like to tell stories about themselves. And it was a while, I mean, you know, there were, Jewish writers, um, and, and still are, but um, filmmaking in Australia really... <coughs> Can I make a suggestion, Ben, because I asked this question about 20 years ago, and the person I asked it to was Maurice Lurie, who was my very close friend at the time in the novelist, and he said it was shell shock from the Holocaust that unlike the American Jews, the Australian Jews mainly came post-war. <clears throat> they were Holocaust survivors. They were trying to build a new life. They didn't want to think about um, anything other than making money, building a new life, creating wealth, passing it on, having jewelry that they might be able to pick up and flee with if anything happened nasty again. So that it took a certain amount of time. And Bob Weiss, who was your producer, on the Danira boys, came from a family who were shocked that he wanted to be involved in cinema. They wanted, they were both Holocaust survivors, both Sarah and Adam, marvellous people. Uh, but they were really shocked that Ben was, that um, Bob was wasting his time in film rather than building up business. And it was that generation, which includes you, that all of a sudden Jewish characters in films came alive again. And as I said before, it took 50 years from that. The last film about Jews was um, Strike Me Lucky in 1935. Uh, I think in Australian cinema, if you count the Salvation Army's, um, the, um, the film about the cross and the Christian, I've forgotten what it's called now, <clears throat> Soldiers of the Cross. And they had one Jewish character, Stephen, St. Stephen who gets stoned. He was the first Jewish character in 1900. And then up to 35, there were five films with Jews, two of which were anti-Semitic characterizations. Then there's this break. And then all of a sudden you come on the scene, Bob and Sandra Levy came with Palace, Palace of Dreams. It took another generation for the, perhaps the impact of the Holocaust to recede. Um, what, what do you think of that as a thesis? Well, my mother was also uh, pretty shocked, but w when I got into it, she loved it. I mean, mm. she, <laughs> she loved being an extra. She, so, <laughs> um, I, I think that, um, 
you know, the the influence of the Holocaust is uh, uh, probably too too uh, convenient to go to explanation for things. All right. I'll tell Norris when I go to heaven um, and I speak with him, I'll say that and, and Ben I, Lewin doesn't like your thesis. And, and I think interestingly, interestingly enough, you now had, you now have a, um, a really lively and, and, and uh, uh, dynamic industry in Israel, particularly television. Um, yes, yes. Which, which has taken at least a generation to generate. You know, I always wondered, you know, it, half of Hollywood is Jewish and they're all making films. What's going on in Israel? When are the Jews going to do their stuff? But it took a generation. And I think that, you know, there's the, the insecurity of everything being new all of a sudden. I don't know um, what uh, possessed people like, um, you know, Goldwyn and Fox and Lowe <clears throat> and Adolf Zucker and all those people, but uh, yeah. um, uh, it, it's, it, 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 that was its own unique situation. And I'm not yes, surprised that it, it didn't just happen everywhere. Okay. Um, I think we better have another question here. Mm -hmm. I've got one from Ali Ratza, who is in a film club that um, I have every Tuesday night and it's organised by Deakin University's CREATE unit. And Ali had a question about Heisenberg, which I think we have answered, but he does say, why did Mo choose to become a spy? You've more or less answered that to a degree, but what's your theory on that? Why did he choose to be a spy? Why was he pushing himself? Taking the photographs on the, the roof in Japan, I think that his, um, and it's, it's the best I can do, but I think his foreknowledge of the, of the war between America and Japan, the fact that he, he did see it coming in the mid 1930s. Um, and um, the, the, also the, the knowledge that his career as a baseball player, you, you know, was, he was approaching his use by date. Yes. yes. And <laughs> one jo some job or another. And I, I think that he was a self-invented spy. I mean, mm. um, and I think that the, the circumstances that he met in Japan um, and, um, you know, that sense that he was a, ahead of the game, that he knew more than others, um, uh, and when, I think this is a fairly authentic part of the film, when, when war was declared, he took his little can of film <clears> along <throat> and said, look, you know, you need me. Mm. Um, and um, I, I really think that um, he, he was, by and large, a man who was entirely his own invention. No one quite lived the life that he did. And... and um, I think that, that that was also part of his own invention rather than, oops, I just got offered a job as a spy. <clears throat> you seem to like him. Whenever you speak about Mo, you smile. There's something about you that seems to feel engaged by the character. Well, I... Is this Paul Rudd's performance, perhaps, which was fantastic? It was yeah. wonderful. I mean, th th there was that side, but also because I, I kind of know more, you know, I got, I got a uh -huh. bit, you know, I read <laughs> enough beyond the book that gave me insights. The fact that, you Good. know, you, you, you know, he tot up these huge bills at Claridge's at the government's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That, that should have been in the film. Should have been yeah. in the film. Yeah, uh, and that was <laughs> part of him being a spy, you know, he, he did yeah. it. <laughs> and there was a lot... You know, there was a lot to like about him. He did have a, um, a wit and a sense of, you know. So, yeah, I do, uh, even though he's still an enigma to me, I do like him. All right. Now, there's just one last question I think we've got time for, and it's David Rose, and says, can Ben speak about the camera work in the film? It was a very particular style. Why did he choose that? 
What was he trying to convey through the style? Um, you, well, you know, you choose a style by choosing a director of photography and you look at a whole lot of people's work. Mm. One director of photography who really impressed me was Andre Parrick. And he'd, um, he'd, one of the films he'd shot was uh, uh, Madame Bovary. And I particularly liked how he'd made um, a, a period film feel modern, that, that there was a lot of mobility in the camera, things didn't look staged. And, um, uh, you know, on top of that, when we met, we got on. It's very important that you get on with uh, a, a director of photography. It's not mm. just, you know, commissioning a painting and, you know, <laughs> It's a, you know, a very close relationship and it, it needs to work. And we pretty much planned um, every shot. Um, and we would look at uh, films like The Conformist mm. um, as a kind of, is this the way we want to light things? Have that mm. guy against the light, that guy <clears throat> and so on so um, it was it was a kind of a process of um, having a kind of film noir style it was for me it was a mix of the conformist and um, um, oh, the third man mm -hmm. uh, uh, and um, Andre taught me a lot of stuff I mean I, I mm -hmm. like working with the multiple mm -hmm. cameras but you know, we worked with as many as four cameras uh, for the battle scene. Mm. Um, and, um, uh, you, you know, we, we, you really create a battle scene and then you follow it like a battle rather than think of it as a filming exercise. You yeah. think it's a battle. Uh, and we shot it all on Leica lenses, interestingly enough, which you know, have a quality that the like the way people talk about wine. That's how mm. we talk about lenses. Um, and it, mm. it was a very, for me, a terrific learning process uh, with a, you know, really uh, gifted uh, director of photography. Well, I think we've virtually come to the, to the hour then. <clears throat> and there are a lot of questions that people want to ask. Hopefully the conversation will be going on in homes. Um, and we wish you well with this film. I think it's a very valid question. Why haven't we seen this film before? Because everybody I know who's seen it really has enjoyed and loved it. And good luck with your Figaro film. We'll look so looking forward to seeing it. And it's great to have you back in Oz. Well, it's so been good lovely luck. to share this with faces I can't see, but I'm sure I know it. <laughs> They all know you now, Ben. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you both, Jan and, and Ben, for, for entertaining us, for taking us behind the scenes, uh, for reminding us why um, film is so important. Last week, when it was announced that we were going back into lockdown here in Melbourne, the Tuesday night and Wednesday night, the last two nights, I went to the movies both nights. I thought if I, I'm not going to be able to go for six weeks, I'm going to, I'm going to go <laughs> the last two nights. So, um, thank you both. Um, I feel like I was eavesdropping on a private conversation in the cafe. It was absolutely <laughs> wonderful. So thank you very, very much for that. There were some other questions. Um, uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to go through them. Thank you um, all for contributing those questions. Um, before we go, I'd just like to remind you next, next month, uh, Tuesday the 11th of August, we've got our first book club book. So just as we... Um, we urged you to watch the film before tonight. Um, uh, Juliet Reedon's The Writing on the Wall. Um, Juliet will be joining us. She'll be talking to Bram Presser about her book. I urge you to buy a copy from Readings or from The Avenue. Um, and you've got a month to read it and, and to join us uh, and to ask Juliet some questions. Um, so that will be, uh, as I said, Tuesday the 11th of August. The best way to keep in touch with us, uh, with our events, um, is to go to our website, subscribe to our newsletter. Um, so Google Jewish, uh, Melbourne Jewish Book Week. I'm sure there's not another one. I'm sure we'll come up number one in the rankings if you don't have the, 
the URL. And just finally, if you enjoyed this evening, I, I do encourage you to, to make a donation. These, these events are free for you, but they're not quite free for us. Uh, and details of how to make a donation will come up um, when, we, when, we, when we end this uh, in just a second. So I do um, uh, just want to thank the Ben and Jan one more time um, for, as I said, for a very entertaining chat. Uh, and thank you all um, who joined us. And I uh, look forward to seeing you on the second um, Tuesday of the month from here on. So uh, good night all and, um, and see you soon. And keep well, keep well and keep safe. Thank you.